Welcome to this week's episode of Top Lines and Tales, your weekly livestock podcast. Uh, as always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Harbro, for their continued support with this podcast. This week we have another character in livestock, this time from Wales. And uh, it's good to get some people on from Wales because we, we haven't had that many in this series, I have to say. But uh, this one comes as a character, not only a top livestock breeder, but a TV presenter, a government advisor, an official who owns his own castle, Bernard Llewellyn. Bernard, welcome to the podcast. Hello. <laughs> And Bernard, yeah, you're, you're, I've got some information on you that's been passed on to me by your son-in-law, Hal Davis. And uh, hello, Hal, if you're listening. And uh, Bernard, you say as well, just explain a little bit uh, about where you are. Well, I suppose I'm closest, uh, if, if you really want to know, to Swansea, in actual fact. Although it's very urban, it's probably the part of Wales that people would know. We're really between Swansea and just on to the edge of the Brecon Beacon. So, if you like, north of Swansea, very rural part of Wales. Okay. And, and you, your family were dairy farmers down there, I, I think, and maybe still do farm dairy well, down there in that part of the world. I, I'm originally from even further west than here, in actual fact, from Pembrokeshire. And certainly there, my whole upbringing evolved around dairy farming, starting off from with my grandfather milking 12 or 14 cows, which I actually did before going to school in the morning while my <laughs> father was busy, which is something I suspect mightn't be that acceptable now. And then <laughs> eventually, when we, when Margaret and I got married, moved up here to Clandilo, bringing that sort of daily trait, which is the only thing I really knew, bringing that with me. But when you come up to a thousand feet from three or four hundred feet above sea level, it makes things an awful lot more difficult. Of course, and our listener will, will some of the listeners will know, some won't, I suppose, but the, the further west you go in Wales, the more grass you get, and generally it is dairy area down in that part of the world, isn't it? It's what everybody farms dairy once you get sort of west of you, but uh, so you said you're moving a little bit higher on, on to higher ground there, but uh, I believe that, um, that the horses were a big thing in, in your family, uh, all of you. <laughs> But I, I hope my wife isn't listening to this, but certainly they've perhaps always been a part of our, our family, either ponies and cobs, or in fact, even more expensive racehorses. Um, the whole family have been involved in that sort of thing. I rode as a, an amateur jockey as a, well, shall we say, in my, in my late teens and early 20s, uh, quite unsuccessfully in actual fact. But we did have, I did have one or two winners uh, in, in national hunt races. Your family have been involved, I know, I think, in, in would your uncle be right, was it, that were involved in the Royal Welsh uh, show there, would be one of the main men, I think, there in, in, in the stewarding ring? I, I think, you know, if you look at both the Royal Welsh and certainly the Pembrokeshire County show, you know, my whole family really have been very involved in that sort of thing. And I think it's Brian that you're referring to in the Royal Welsh, I think he was one of the main ring stewards for many, many years in actual fact. He was the guy with the brown bowler hat, which I think is why well, some people would recognise those that have been to the to the Royal Welsh. <laughs> there's a there's a few bowler hats there, but a brown bowler hat probably sticks there. But a fantastic show that the Royal Welsh is, of course, with the horses, and and we, we'll all know that. But you you you've got a a lot of cousins there, I think. Uh, um, Bernard uh, seems to be related to half a size Wales, maybe. But <laughs> you've got cousins there, and one of your cousins was a was a jockey, maybe. Um, Carl, would I be I the right one? There? That's right, yeah, yeah. Carl, Carl's well, he's probably one of the most infamous. In fact, I use that word advisedly, but he is probably one of the most infamous, infamous cousins. He won the national. Well, in fact, he won it, I think it was probably three times, but one of them, was, they weren't disqualified, but the, the race was abandoned. But certainly he was a, a very successful national and jockey. He did begin then uh, doing a bit of training as well, and he still actually help, helps out um, Tristan Davis, as a, as a, uh, he helps him in his training and he does a bit of travelling as far as some of his horses are concerned. So and again, it's a, it's a situation where you can't get away from these horses the whole time. <laughs> and you're talking the Grand National here, are we? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. When the Grand National, I say, we're not a horse called Party Politics, if I remember rightly. And he, he also won it um, when I think there was some issue with, with the start or, or something went on, and he won it on that occasion as well but he was very successful you know right across the, the, the national hunt field of, of, of racing uh, and, and another cousin I think um, Helen would, would be she'd be involved in the in the Grand National <laughs> somewhere there. 
Well, that was the Gold Cup, I think that was. Her father-in-law um, trained uh, the winner of the, of the Gold Cup. Certainly, it was one of the few times where you just had, he was what they call a permit holder, just training a few horses, uh, really for his own enjoyment as much as anything. And then they had this horse that was, was quite successful and, and uh, um, went on, I'd say, to win the Gold Cup as, a, as an outsider. So, again, another family involvement, as you say. And uh, an easy win. He beat he beat a horse called Desert Orchid, I believe. <laughs> well, that's the one name that I did remember. <laughs> I mean, Desert Orchid was, you know, he was even one of the horses of our time. Uh-huh. And he, I remember him being hot favourite for that for that particular race. Mm-hmm. But I, I fortunately back the winner at a hundred to one, to one, which uh, <laughs> helped my financial situation as far as horses are concerned. <laughs> Well, and 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 just going to yourself and your own your own prowess, uh, big man and the young farmers, I think, and and uh, you you travel with the young farmers, uh, and um, for all the cattle man, you you got a bit of sheep shearing in there as well. Well, we I tried all the way through to take advantage of every opportunity that I had, uh, and young farmers have been a huge part of my life. I chaired Wales Young Farmers after spending a lot of time on the council of of NFYSC. Um, and through that, met a lot of interesting people and perhaps, I suppose, honed my skills at dealing with politicians as well. I think, you know, if, if I were to say to one reason why I've been able to well, try and nobble politicians, um, it, it really was through young farmers. Went to Canada on an on exchange visit with them, very involved with Holsteins at, at that particular time. Uh, again, met people that... Uh, still have contact with him sort of you know over 40 years later well, that's a brilliant thing isn't it and we've talked about this quite a few times on this podcast with various people that you know on the american side and on the the uk side where if you're involved in young farmers and you learn how to speak and you learn how to to sit on committees that uh, it stands you in great stead and, and it's it's the great um advocate for the youngsters there just to to do that that you it, it gives you such a great grounding isn't it to talk to people well, I think it comes home to you when you perhaps sit on committees that aren't as well managed as perhaps they should be. And you can get quite critical, in fact, of, of how other people share, particularly how other people share and how other people behave in, in a, a committee situation as well. For it to be effective, it's that grounding that I had from young farmers that, you know, just happened to make most of the committees that I've been certainly involved with in a very close way, try and make them as effective as you can. And we'll go on to your political career in in a minute or two, and and, and today's political minefield. This, and, and we'll go on to maybe have a chat about that just now. But let's just go back there that, that I mentioned sheep shearing, and and you did. You you were a shearer and and contract shearer, earning your money, earning your spurs, I suppose. Uh, um, clipping sheep. Well, certainly it was the first thing that well, when we got married and moving to a to a, a holding further up the hill. Sheep are obviously part of the equation. You know, they always had been in this particular farm. But I certainly had done nothing at all with sheep except take the wool off. And I suppose in a way that's down to necessity. It was a small dairy farm at home. Um, I wasn't terribly well paid by, by my parents. And certainly going out to make some extra money was, you know, it was, I think A, it was a good learning curve. It also taught you to appreciate money. And it also learned that, you know, hard work never really killed anyone. It nearly did on a few occasions, but certainly I think that work ethic is something that, that the shearing I did did help. And also, you know, you got around, certainly around most of Pembrokeshire, um, shearing quite a lot of sheep when, when I was well, quite a bit younger now, I suppose. But it was a, a good exercise and it also, um, taught me a lot about different types of farming, certainly in Pembrokeshire, you know, a variation from very intensive arable farming, dairy farms, and to the, the hills of the Preseli as well, where we t- tended to end uh, the shearing season. And so mm-hmm. whenever you go and look at that sort of thing, I, I think you always learn something. And also going to the same farms year after year, you could see how things were developing or going the other way in actual fact. So it was, it. it's an experience. I get you on that, and I believe you did fairly well at it, because uh, a little bird tells me that you, you bought yourself a sports car out of the earnings. Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose that, that's another story, but uh, 
I did fight by a, a Reliance Senator, and um, I remember going to an NFYFC AGM, and they, I think it was Tanner Shields was the guy at the top at that time. So again, that's aging me. And uh, the comment was from from the stage, uh, a Reliance Senator has turned up. We're not sure if it's Bernard Trevelyan or Her Royal Highness Prin- Princess Anne, because she had one at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, um, the, the centre of the country there, Princess Anne, and, and Cirencester, and I believe you were at Cirencester, weren't you? For uh, uh, You did a stint there at, as a, to, at college, university. I'm not quite sure how it tra- trades itself these days. Well, I think going from being a college to a university is a bit of a letdown to me. I was always very proud that it was a college, and that it was quite practical in its, its nature. I'm sure it is now, but I'm not quite sure what being a, a university actually does bring to the whole scenario of, of, of being there. Um, I, all right, perhaps it's a, a biased, old-fashioned idea, really. And to have university status obviously does something for it, probably simply as far as income is concerned. But it was, a, 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 it was a, an education in many ways as far as I was concerned. I did quite a lot of racing when I was there. I was secretary of the, of the pack of beagles when I was there. In fact, I, I hunted them a bit as well. But I think probably the most significant thing was that it it really introduced me to you know a, a, such a broad base of people who had an interest in ag- agriculture or indeed in, in estate management as well because the two courses that that were there at the time they ran concurrently and and you met a lot of very very different people from very very different backgrounds uh, with very very different ability and uh, I suppose uh, with very, very different amounts of money as well. And that's always good to, to broaden your horizons, isn't it? That's exactly what I was going to mention, that it is such a diverse amount of diverse type of person that does go to, to the uh, to mm. the RAC and, and uh, yeah, as you said, all the different ones. And, and you'd all get on and you'll go there and take different things out of it from there. And uh, fr- from there, from your, going back to the young farmer's days there, that uh, you met your, your wife, uh, Margaret, I think, in the, in the young farmer's times. And... Uh, that moved you on again, uh, Bernard. Well, it, it 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 at that time it was sort of called the Marriage Bureau of the countryside, wasn't it? And I think certainly, you know, that uh, things are very different now, obviously, aren't they? You know, with with people meeting online and this sort of thing. But that opportunity wasn't there at that time. I'm not sure whether we've advanced or or gone backwards as far <laughs> as relationships are concerned. But certainly. It it worked for us, uh, and it worked for many many other people at that time as well. And and and, and uh, Margaret's uh, father's family, I think, were the ones we met. I mentioned earlier on at the top of this this uh, podcast that uh, you owned a castle, and and uh, uh, your fa- her father's family were tenants of uh, of Carrick Cannon Castle for had been for, like, for quite a while, I think. Yeah, a number of generations, about four generations, where they they've been tenants to the Corder Estate. And um, eventually, my my father-in-law was offered the farm as a sitting tenant. And um, because the the whole thing was was part of a large estate, there were no actual individual deeds associated with this farm. And when they were drawn up, the red line went around the outside. And I suppose what he, he meant to happen was to a red line to go around the castle, which is r- virtually right in the middle of the farm. Um, and as a result of that, well, shall I say we acquired the castle? <laughs> shall I, can I just ask the quarter estates? And I, is that the same quarter as in quarter castle up in Scotland? Would that be the same Absolutely. same family? Yes, it same, is in Inverness. Yep, same, same of quarter as as mentioned in Macbeth, and and in fact they they own quite a lot of land in this part of the world and further west in Pembrokeshire. In fact, I did. So there was sort of a two mini estates, well, almost three mini estates uh, here in Newcastle, Emily, and in Pembrokeshire. As well as in Scotland, yeah, well, I went I went up to Quarter Castle in, uh, in Scotland oh, a number of years ago now, and uh, it was just quite interesting. A number of the people that were working there had been involved down here as well. Oh, interesting, because you'll you may have bumped into my friend uh, David Walker, who's big into his Clydesdale horses. In fact, you know, they, they're showing Clydesdale at the World Clydesdale Show this weekend, and he farms uh, a lot of Quarter Castle estates. So that's that's an interesting. Um, yeah. Combination, uh, and but yeah. let's let's go back to to this castle. As I said, it's 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 grand, and you've made it uh, made it so. But it's a big. Uh, would I say derelict would be the right word? Uh, um, tell me a little bit more about the castle there, Bernard. Just just Kerry well, Castle. What what it does? 
Yeah, I mean, it is. It is very much a ruin. I think its great advantage is that that, that uh, it, it's in an amazing situation. It's very much location, location, location. And uh, it sits on a hill overlooking the surrounding area. Um, and I suppose it, it, we've developed it what we'd like to think in sort of a tasteful way. We've just developed some of the buildings down on the farmyard, which sit below it. Uh, and um, I suppose it, it, it's the way in which we've developed it that most people appreciate. I'd like to think anyway. Um, I am reminded of, of, of the child in a, in a, a drawing uh, situation when he was learning to draw things in school. And uh, this this railway train turns up and you've always got this iconic uh, chimney in the front with the smoke coming from it. The reality is that that sort of thing is long gone, but it's still very much part of, of how people think of, of trains. And in the same way, they think of farmyards with chickens around and ducks on the pond and that sort of thing. You know? mm -hmm. So it's, it's retaining the character is what we've tried to do. Okay, and and we'll we'll just go on to the castle a little bit more and what you've done with it since. But I mean, back then you 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 would be when you took the farm over there, you'd be milking still and, and back into yeah, milking yeah, Frisians yeah. and 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 competing with Frisians as well, competing with your livestock anyway. Yes, well, in a very small way. I mean, there were some very high-powered herds in Carmarthenshire at that time. Uh, the, the, the Grove herd in particular was was renowned for for Frisian cattle. And in fact, went on to to deal with Holsteins as well afterwards, and they'd be not near na neighbours, but certainly they would have been very much acquaintances. And there were several other as well, you know, ar around Clandilo too. But they tended to be milking in the valley, whereas you know we're at almost a thousand feet here. And I think we learned quite early that competing either with Pembrokeshire or with the Towie Valley was difficult when, you know, your winter was perhaps an, an extra month longer, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and grass was a bit slower getting going. Sure, sure. I mean, it, it definitely it, the geography and, and the altitude tends to, to make a difference to the, to the, the, especially the dairy world, to all livestock world, I suppose. And you ended up selling the, selling the milk and herd, I believe. Well, most of the cows went, went back to my father in actual fact, and then we sold some off as well. He was expanding at that time back in Pembrokeshire. And um, so I say most of them ended up down there. But certainly, you know, it, it, it was a decision really that, that it was forced upon us both by um, the pressure that tourists were starting to put on the farmyard. As you said, you know, a lot of dairy cows and, and tourists don't really mix that well. Sure. When you see a... a a lady trying to walk through a bit of cow muck in high heel shoes. It, uh, well, it, it does make you think, you know, should I really be doing this? <laughs> and again, going back to politics, we won't go into that one. Let's uh, let's just go on then. So you sold the, the, the milk and herd. You've got a castle. Uh, you've got a, you know, a, a family around you. And, uh, and then you decided to go a, a change of direction and go into rare breeds, maybe, may, maybe from the tourist's point of view. I think, with you know, Part of, of, of that decision really was to add to the castle. I always think of, of, of the castle as sort of the, the backstop or the, or the, you know, the last thing that, that probably would, would, would fall over, not so much physically, but obviously as far as, as a, a, a financial attribute is concerned. So no matter what we do, people are going to come here. But if, if we can capitalize on that by, either selling them something or keeping them here longer or getting them more interested or getting the profile of the place up, it was obviously going to be a plus. And I, I suppose the, the castle made that something which wasn't quite as, as or it was an easier decision to make when people are already coming to the castle. And we had, in fact, sort of tried to do a little bit before that. You know, initially it was only sort of sell, selling postcards from, one of the one of the rooms uh, as he went into the house, and then ice creams and that sort of thing, and then it developed from there. I mean, I think people use this term organically, um, but it was very much like that. As we made a bit of money, we put it back into that side of the business rather than into the agricultural side. Before we go on to the, the, the different types of, of uh, stock you put on the disc, go back to the castle there, there would be an upkeep you know, to, to keep that going. I mean, I don't know in, in what sort of state of ruin it is, but there would be an annual upkeep to, to, to maintain that financially, which would be a draw, be a drain rather. 
I, I think with all that, particularly with scheduled monuments, it really is, is about the standard that's expected by government to, for the upkeep of that. And that really was a major part of our thinking initially. But what we've actually done is we, we formed a guardianship agreement in conjunction with CADU, which are the equivalent to English Heritage. Okay. So they're, they're, they are, A, they, we share the gate receipts, um, a percentage coming to us and a percentage going to CADU. Uh, but in fact, they're responsible for any major maintenance. Okay. I think you know, if I analyze the money that, that, that we pay in a, as a percentage term into, into Cadu every year, it would probably easily pay for a stonemason. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, if they're doing it themselves, you know, they can't complain to me that, that it isn't up to the quality they expect. And in a way that, that's only fair, it, you know, all right, although we actually own it. It's really just, you know, it's, it's just lent to us for the time that we're here, really. Uh, I don't think anybody can actually own something which is as significant as that um, to the country of Wales, really. Sure. And just give us a little bit more about the castle, the sort of size of it and the age of it as well, when, you know, it goes back yeah. to it and, and what history is behind the castle. It, it's late 13th, early 14th century castle, so I love to tell Americans when they come, it's really a very modern building compared to some. <laughs> and in fact, we, we have buildings on the farm that probably predate uh, the castle itself it's um <laughs> i suppose that the, the, the significant thing is that it, it's in quite a strange place really because most castles are situated where they're they're probably protecting something or they're a form of protection for it mm-hmm. whereas with us we're out in the middle of nowhere so most historians suggest that, that, that really the site has been developed from initially, in fact, a cave dwelling, which is underneath the castle itself. And certainly that may even be earlier than prehistoric because some work has been done recently and then they keep making it or, or su- suspecting that it was inhabited even before they originally thought. And then uh, as the cave perhaps became a, a less acceptable place to live, there was we think a wooden hill fort built here. And if you analyze it, it's actually a very good place for a hill fort because it commands such a huge area around it. When the old counties were in existence here, they used to say you could see seven counties from here, but it, there is a, a huge area around that, that you can see. And then as the walls of the hill fort began to deteriorate, they were replaced with, with, with stone wall, stone locally well locally quarried from just below the castle in fact so the whole site really is a progression from a cave dwelling uh to a wooden hill fort and then the stone castle <laughs> i can see why you say it's uh, relatively modern we're talking probably two three thousand years in, uh, well, and behind well, and what no, sort of size are we looking at bernard what's you'd probably get about 70 cows inside it as well you know that that sort of building size it, okay. it's it's quite an involved building. There, there are what they've got. There are outer wards to it as well, which would have been the first defence of it. Although it's difficult to really make a, an argument why it needed to be defended, but uh, certainly it, it's, uh, I say, quite a sophisticatedly designed um, building. Although, in actual fact, if you to look at it as sort of from a, a drone or something, it is. It's a series of squares, and then you have to put it together to see how it's designed to to be defended. Okay. We'll carry on with that before we go on to a livestock podcast is what we we run here. We'll talk about the livestock in a second, but just just carry on through that, that you developed you know, various things around that to make it a tourist attraction that it is now, and you've got tea rooms and, and, and various other things, and you get a, a lot of visitors, I think. Yeah, we, we get about 80,000 visitors a year. Okay. Some of them that, that we can take a bit of money off and some of them we don't take as much off. <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, we, we've done, red, well, we still do wedding receptions here. We used to do the whole thing uh, with the wedding breakfast as well. And we offered them a, a huge choice of me- menu. They either had long on beef, long on beef, or they could have long on beef. And if they didn't <laughs> want that, they could go somewhere else. <laughs> Perhaps an attitude that not not every re- retailer is able to to adopt, but it's just part of the principle why we did it anyway. So sure. you know you have to stick to your guns. Sure, sure, and that's yeah, brilliant that you have that. And we mentioned the rare breeds, and as I said, as a livestock podcast, you 
you've had uh, Soe sheep, I think, and Baldwin sheep and Welsh black sheep. But I mean, it's the, the the Longhorns probably the main one. But just talk us through the other animals that you you had there before you got into the Longhorns, or maybe at the same time. Yeah, well, I I think it was almost by accident. In fact, one of your previous contributors, um, Peter Close, uh, we went to the Rarebury sale up in Stoney. I don't know how many years ago, and we bought you know a Noah's Ark really of of, of, of different cattle and, and sheep and all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And really, I think you know what we found was what we got on with best in in you know what what that's what stayed the course. And longhorns are, are very much part of that. And I think, you know, it was down to several reasons, I suppose, as much as anything. They just suited this farm to a certain extent. They were very attractive. And we've, we've done a lot of work over the years in what they call dressing film sets, where we supply animals to go on with period dramas and that sort of thing. And in the same way that they were acceptable within that, I think they're acceptable... To, to the punters that that come here as well, I think we perhaps o- over overestimate uh, uh, the knowledge of, of of people who live outside the countryside. You know, urban dwellers tend to have well, it's something with horns, so it must be a bull, that sort of idea. <laughs> so we've tried to keep something which which is attractive enough to be different, and yet at the same time, you know, produces half de- decent beef. And and be relatively easy to manage. And let's go. We'll go on to the to the prowess that you that you've gone on with uh, long on since that days when when you put the Peter close. But uh, I mentioned the Suey sheep and and the oh, rather yeah. and 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 Baldwin's. My mother kept Baldwin's for a while. They were buggers, they were difficult things to breed, and you had Welsh <laughs> Welsh blacks and 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 Din Dinifire White Park or did that. Did, 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 yeah, the White Park had a lot of those, which are now quite rare, in fact. Mm. Uh, certainly compared to long ones. Um, we had, Dinover was one of the places where two or three White Park herds were, well, they were the only ones that were remaining, really. And uh, Dinover, is, I think, is the basis for most of the White Park herd book at, at the moment. Okay. We had some of those originally. But we actually sold them back to the National Trust, which seemed to be quite a good idea at the time. As you said, you had a, you had a number of <laughs> a zoo there of of of, of uh, yeah. rare, rare breeds for a while, and and uh, and then focused on on rare breeds that would be attractive to your to your visitors and and, and punters, if you like, coming in through the gate, yeah. but also something that would make you money, and that's kind of where you, where the long ones started to to grow themselves financially. Well, I I think whenever you diversify into anything, you have to have a very open mind about how you do treat it. And certainly, you know, if there's an opportunity there to set to sell what you're producing, that's all, all, all obviously going to be central, really, to your to your choice of animal. You know, the the soies were lovely, and and they they really did look good up on the castle because it's it's a high mound, as you can imagine, mm-hmm. and these little brown things running about there that most people thought were goats anyway. <laughs> um, was and you know. It, 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 they weren't the most productive of things, although in actual fact they do produce more milk per kilo of body weight than any other sheep, as I understand. Is that right? right? Well, that's, an, well, that's, that's a that, fact. That's what I've been told, anyway. <laughs> yeah. but, but certainly, you know, getting a half decent carcass out of them wasn't easy. We had to resort to perhaps, uh, selling them to a few restaurants, and I'm told, I, I don't know for a fact, that they used to pass it off as venison in actual fact. <laughs> You hang it for long enough, and anything that tastes like venison, I suppose. <laughs> That's true enough, and as you said, they're not the biggest and not the easiest to farm and catch either. I mean, the wild little buggers that they are—they're not native to your part of the world, of course. They're native to the oh, no, no. to the north of Scotland, but they they can be some some uh, um, <laughs> flighty little buggers, to to say well, the they, least. They don't flock either. That. That's the significant thing. They all run off in different directions, so you can have a damn good dog to do anything with them. <laughs> we'll go on to go on to your your prowess with the dogs in a minute too. But let's talk about oh, the, let's talk about the the, the Longhorns then. And and I believe that uh, Peter Close, as you said, has been on this podcast before, and and, and a friend of mine, uh, you and he had a little bit of a a, a bet or a challenge that uh, you guys could could be the top guys in in the breed, and and you have. <laughs> well, I'm dying. You know, there are a number of very good herds in the breed now. Some people who spent a lot of money and some people like me who spent very little. But in actual fact, you know, I, I suppose we, we could be considered to be amongst the top anyway. I think the important thing was that both of us came 
from very much an agricultural background, whereas, in fact, there were a lot of, of long-horn breeders that were either perhaps, perhaps, I mean, slightly unkind, but landed gentry with the states and this sort of thing, and they were perhaps more concerned about horn shape than they were about confirmation. Whereas, you know, I think particularly the farmers that are involved in it now, you know, I, I came up through the young farmers' stock judging scenario, and, and you know, I, I'd like to think I've got a fair idea about confirmation. And I think it does show that over the years, and I'm sure particularly a lot of interbreed judges would agree, that we have developed the breed in a way which is appropriate, perhaps, to, to modern-day needs, rather than worrying about having black tips to the horn, which would affect that horn when it was used as a, as a, as a, a substitute for glass in lanterns. It's hardly that relevant these days. And also, again, as I say about the shape of the horns, um, certainly I've adopted the idea that bonnet horns, which, which come in closer to the face, just make them slightly easier to manage as much as anything, but not really that critical as far as the either the carcass or the confirmation is concerned. That's a classic uh, remark that, that I've heard happen in, in the Scottish blackface sheep as well, where they want to turn the horns out, but the ones turned in make them easy to manage too. But, uh, but going on with those longhorns, you went on to become one of the of the top breeders in amongst it. And, and as you said, it's, it's moving away maybe from the uh, hobby farmers there to taking this job seriously, and, and seriously you did. Well, I, I think also they were originally developed for, for a tri-purpose as both craft animals for milk and for beef. And in fact, probably as much as anything for, for the fat to, to, to like London. That was what Bakewell is supposedly of, of, supposed to have, have developed. But I, you know, I think they very much do have a place, I'm convinced of that, as I think do all native breeds at the moment. Um, you know, we're going down this climate change road and, and, we're going to be criticised if we if we're not seen to be to me making an attempt at at utilising grass, which can also sequestrate carbon. So in a way that they, they, they suit my purpose ideally because they're attractive, they're very kind, um, docile animals. They I've got two or three footpaths that are very very well used running through the farm, particularly close to the castle, and obviously keeping them close to the castle, they achieve their objective of of just well, what we call it about uh, uh, sorting out the set and, and dressing it and just, it's a case of, well, can we go to the castle where the funny cows are? And I, I don't mind people calling them funny cows as long as they come. Well, that's brilliant. And as you said, some of them see them with horns and think they're bulls and people that that learn that they can walk amongst them, then uh, it, it does good for the livestock industry. Maybe everybody really needs to know that... Uh, Obviously, you you do take your care when you walk, walk amongst uh, cattle and, uh, and bulls and such like. But, I mean, it's great to think that you're educating people that uh, you, you can be in amongst these things. And let's go back to, I mentioned earlier on that uh, you had a challenge, I think, with Peter Close. And Peter, if you're listening, <laughs> hello there. You've uh, you've had your say on this one, so Bernard's going to come back to you. But uh, you guys had a little bit of a bet, I think, uh, going back the way as who could be the best breeder of these, these uh, longhorns. And uh, I think that's a challenge that's been... Uh, both of you have, have, have won a little bit of. Yeah, well, I suppose, you know, we, we, we've, in the auction ring, perhaps we've done slightly better than, than most other breeders have. In fact, well, in fact, uh, recently that, that, that's that been topped as well. But certainly we we sold a number of bulls that rate amongst the most expensive bought at auction. And it's still not big money compared to the Lins and the Charolais and that sort of thing. But at the same time, you know, our costs are not as high either. You know, they, they don't guzzle food in the same way that some of these continentals do. But certainly I would never dream of suggesting that uh, I could even compete with Peter as far as this sort of master breeder idea is concerned because his experience. And if I think what he is able to do is he, he's able to sell his best and still keep his best, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> he's, 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 he's quite clever at doing that. And, you know, we've only really sold... You know, sold bulls um, successfully, or right, we've had half decent money for females as well. But certainly, bulls is what we seem to do well, and I think that really is down to depth of breeding. I think perhaps people probably keep bulls because they think, oh, this one has come and it's okay. But if if mum is, is pretty rough, it's a, it's a pretty dangerous thing to do to to keep a bull out of a poor quality cow. Um, 
certainly, you know, I think, well, it obviously is it's the same as far as all livestock is concerned. The greater depth you've got, you miss the occasional page. But at the same time, most of the time, that, that reliability in the depth of breeding will always come back. Of course, of course. The, the wise words and words we've heard from a lot of breeders, but it's great to hear it from from some of the older breeds as well. Uh, uh, that that there's, you know, the general uh, rule of genetics always rings true. And let's go back to this bet there. I believe, and I'm, maybe I've been told this from the third party. You might, get, but uh, you and he had a bet that who could win the the the, the three mainland royal shows in in one mm. year. And uh, I'm not quite sure how that finished up. Well, I, I got very close, shall we say. I got beaten in the, in the Royal by um, by a bull. That, well, anyway, I got beaten, and that's, it's, as, it's, as, it's as close as that. But certainly, I suppose to sort of recompense, recompense that, Peter it, 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 and with another two others actually bought the bull off me afterwards. So in a way, whether I won the bet or not is irrelevant. I, I was probably the major winner as far as the finance was concerned in any case. So you you won, I believe, in 2004, I think the year was, you, right. you won yeah. the champion at the Highland and the Royal, and then uh, and uh, and you just got pipped at the Royal Welsh. And I've had that same thing yeah. this year, to be fair, with my sheep. I won. I managed to win the win win the, the Highland and the and the Yorkshire, and then got pipped at the Royal Welsh. And in your oh, home yeah. in your home country, that hurts a little bit. But uh, as you said, right. um, Peter Close went on to buy the ball. Yeah, well, it it does hurt, but I think it is also important for showing. I think. That's the great thing about it is that, you know, it really is only one man or one woman's opinion. And if it didn't change, if it ended up the same way every time, it would be a pretty poor show. And I think we'd soon stop, wouldn't we? Well, that's so, true. And, and a man or woman has to have the balls to put you down if they don't think, if your, your animal's gone on too long or maybe it's gone a bit stayed or maybe it, didn't, it was beaten by a better animal. That's the way that showing goes. Absolutely. Or, or perhaps it's lack of knowledge on part of the judge. I should edit that out, but I won't. We'll carry on. And the bull was sold, I think, for for a, a record price to Peter Close. It was a, yeah, it was a record at that time. I think it was about eight now for nine thousand something like that. Eight thousand um, four hundred, I have written down. So that's they are uh, there. We are. And a record at that time, which I think says, still yeah. stands. Would I be right? Still stands to this day well, for it, a male anyway. Still, still stands for a bull. The, a, a cow did make about twelve thousand. Um, Earlier on this year, in actual okay. fact, or end of last year, yeah. So a breed is still on the go, as we mentioned. You mentioned earlier on, well, and, yeah. and we've had a podcast re- uh, previously on the on the Longhorns, and they're still on the up, and the prices are still there. But uh, congratulations on still holding the the breed record, uh, anyway. And at the same time, I think you sold heifers for, for decent money as well. Three thousand was a breed record, I think, when you broke it. Yeah. Uh, when that was. Yeah, I think I think perhaps that's the most important thing about any. Yeah breeder of, of any significance really is that you know you need a certain amount of uniformity within your herd and that really should bring you consistency as far as the marketplace is concerned as well i mean now the, the interesting thing is that probably a lot of these cattle are worth more in boxes than they are worth to, 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 to breeders um and, and and in a way that's a good thing because we've always actually killed about 10 percent of our females and Virtually 80 or even 90 percent of our bulls, because I think it is retaining that quality, and only what do they say? Breed the best, feed the best, and hope for the best, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, it? It is that idea that you know you should be perhaps more critical, no matter where you are in the chain, whether you're a top breeder or just beginning. It is important that you try and retain that quality as, as best you can all the way through. Certainly, right. I think it, yeah, it is a mistake. I think that a lot of people make breeding anything is is to think that everything is good just because it its mum was good then. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true, and and you, we see that time and again, it, especially in the I would say a minority isn't quite the right word, but in the, in the smaller breeds where everybody thinks that everybody's going to buy you know, everything that we've got out of it, uh, and it has to be a you know, a bottom end. But it's not just a bottom end, is it? Because if you're if you're killing these animals, as you mentioned, they're worth more in a box, and I mean there are a lot of people now that are that are supplying you know, longhorn beef or, or special specialist uh, uh, minority breeds. Uh, beef out there and, and lamb does that matter to the general public and uh, as you said you can charge a premium for that are you doing a bit of that yourself We'd, we've done it for about oh almost 20 years i think uh, i mean we get people here that, that drive from bristol which will be about an hour and a half drive from us and just to pick up a box of beef you know and i think that's 
that sort of thing does say that, that you are producing a premium product and that there is demand for it. What I found very interesting is, is, is the most significant thing about all those customers that we've had for many years, um, driving from wherever. They can all cook. And I think that really is an important part of it. No matter how good a quality you produce, as far as the, 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 the whether it be beef or lamb or anything else, selling it into a niche market, that will never work if the board the other side doesn't know how to utilize it then. I do my bit. I, I try and feed them right. I try and make sure that they're slaughtered right, they're hung correctly, and, and the carcasses are cut up as they should be. Again, that's a very important part of it. That's but if the board buying it can't cook, you know, you're on a hammering to nothing to be honest. That's very, very true there, Bernard. A friend of mine, uh, um, Donald McPherson, who I remember him doing his Nuffield scholarship at the time, and Donald runs a successful uh, um, beef supply business in Scotland, and he said there's seven parts to producing a, you know, a steak on the plate, and the, and the very last mm-hmm. one is the guy that cooks it, and that's, that's, yeah. very, that's very true. So, and, and let's move on to, to your... Well, you, you, you're you're a committee man. That's not the word. A council man in, in in various ways, and you were on the Longhorn Council, I think, for a, 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 a quite a long period of time. And you will have done your share of, of promoting that breed and, and keeping it from the taking it from the minority breed or, or off the rare breed list. I think it is now to to where it is now. Yeah, we're now a, a called a minority breed, or uh, it depends which shows you go to. Sometimes you can sort of sneak in the, the back door to some of these classes that are not open to everyone. So there are pluses as far as that's concerned. But I think referring it to as a rare breed is, well, it, it's probably always been a mistake in actual fact because, you know, the numbers of cattle have been there. The numbers of registered cattle, you know, there is quite a deficiency between those cattle that are registered and, and, and the long ones that are around. And a lot of people are obviously capitalizing on this niche market scenario. But certainly, you know, I, 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 I've always felt that really they should be given some consideration in a way horns were a disadvantage as, that, as far as that was concerned because a lot of, of commercial breeders, they were, they were an issue. Well, now in actual fact, we're allowed to sell um, or allowed to, to show cattle that have been disbudded. And not something that I have to say I actually agreed with because, well, for me, a longhorn without horns, you know, it's quite difficult to accept it. But I, on the other hand, I can certainly understand why commercial farmers work, would want to have these horns off. And indeed, I, you know, we, we've sold quite a lot of cattle that have gone on to, to, to do various things to be crossed with, particularly with things like blues, um, which probably gives you a, an almost perfect carcass in actual fact, because they pop these calves out very easily compared to a lot of other breeds. And certainly the, the fact that they haven't been messed around with, as far as the, the, certainly the bone structure is concerned, makes them quite an easy animal to manage. And more recently, you know, we've sold a couple of bulls into genus and uh, those bulls have been used on dairy cows. And really what's coming back from that is that, you know, these calves are very thrifty. They're on their feet. And they're trying to do something, you know, trying to to make their way in, in, in the world very quickly. And really, if you analyze it, you know, dairy farmers in particular are under so much pressure these days as far as staffing is concerned. Having a good, bright, sharp calf getting up is probably as important as anything. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, as you said, the longhorn doesn't necessarily have to have a longhorn, but it has the quality of all that. And going back a long time, of course, it, I mean, the longhorn will be probably older than your than your own castle there in in, uh, in, yeah. In, yeah. In, in terms of where it started. And let's just go on to do what else, because you're a man that does get involved in a few things. And I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier on that uh, yeah, I think at the top of the podcast here that uh, you, you're a politician and an advisor and, and you've been an NFU delegate in Brussels and uh, that that is, is something politics at the moment are on, on the agenda but let's just let me let me know a little bit more about uh, what you were doing in Brussels well I think as you say um, it was a, a, a committee that really was about the environment as much as anything and not something that certainly a lot of farmers would be prepared to, to get involved in certainly you know I suppose almost 20 years ago when I first got involved but really, I think, you know, we have a, a, an obligation almost, certainly those of us that are able to communicate a, a message and express ourselves, 
to get as involved with with politicians as as, as best we can. Really, uh, I think it might be fair to say that an awful lot of farmers wouldn't want to go down that road. So I think if you if you feel that you have the ability, or at least probably that the uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the patience really to 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 put up with politicians because they have to be dealt with whether we like what they say or what they don't say. And certainly at a European level, uh, the meetings I used to go, it was, it was called the Agriculture and the Environment uh, Working Group within the Commission itself. And it used to be sort of a, a, a two or even a three-day meeting. And the most difficult day would be the, would be the first day probably when as farmers, as, as part of the European Union, we, we all got together and actually deciding on our plan of attack from that meeting was probably more of a problem than it was when we were actually in with the commission. <laughs> I mean, I think that's perhaps the story of farmers, isn't it? Yeah. You know, everyone has got their different views uh, around the world. And certainly, I, I felt that we were gold plating an awful lot of rules from Europe when, when I was there in particular. And certainly a lot of other countries got away with a huge amount that, that we wouldn't have got away with here. And perhaps uh, that perhaps affected my, my, my thoughts about, you know, Brexit and, and, and other things as well. But certainly it was something I think any farmer that feels they have the ability, well, even if they don't feel they have the ability, if they have the inclination to do it, you know, it's about a, a willing volunteer, isn't it? So you uh, you would be an elected, by the local uh, NFU, you would, you would be the elected body to go there and talk for them as, uh, against Europe, yeah. is that right? Or at Europe? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was elected initially at a county level to go on NFU council. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I didn't do that much time on council, but I did attend where well, what was then the, the, I think land use and something of a committee it was called, but it was what, what now a rural affairs. And, um, as, as a representative of Wales on that, in actual fact, I was then elected to, to go to Europe and, Okay. and try and knock some sense into some of these politicians that don't know an awful lot about agriculture. <laughs> and also, also interesting to, to work with environmental NGOs as well mm. that had come from all over Europe. And that in itself was a, an interesting scenario that I, I carried on since, in fact, because, again, a lot of people don't like working with environmental NGOs, in particular people like the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust and this sort of thing. But again, you know, you really have to get involved with these people if you're going to have any effect on what they're doing. And certainly, uh, to, I suppose, to, to, to be aware of the way they're thinking rather than just the way you think yourself. And, and then you take some of that back, I guess, for, from, I mean, I know you're involved in the in the Brecon Beacons National Park now, which is, again, a fantastic thing. And a, I think you're an advisor in there and the Forestry Commission and various things. And you would have taken some of that back maybe from Europe, to, from talking to some of the other guys that, that were in, in other parts of, of Europe to bring, the, to bring their stuff back in as well as, as, as pitching your own your own uh, oh, advice very much so i think as i said earlier on if you go anywhere and you don't learn from that and and there's, there's always going to be something there which is a, a positive as far as they're concerned uh you know europe is a very very diverse part of the of, of, of the world uh and you know probably as diverse as any other continent in actual fact and and, and but at the same time really a lot of the problems are exactly the same in spain or in Italy that that they are here, but they're just sort of slightly slanted in a slightly different way. There, uh-huh. and 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 so as I said, you're you're so you're an ambassador, I suppose, for uh, an, an advisory panel, I think, for 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 the Forestry Commission and uh, the National Resources of Wales, and and uh, uh, you're a man that's making a difference in in in, in amongst the, the the Welsh country. I th- I think my son-in-law has been quite <laughs> wild in his. It is uh, what he suggested I'm able to do. I think you just keep you just keep sometimes knocking your head against the wall, but I think you dare not stop. Or at least I've I've always felt that. I don't do as much now as I used to do. I'm I'm the wrong side of seventy, and I think it is very much you know people who are really in touch with what's going on to to carry this on. I still do. I've been to a meeting tonight, but at the same time. Perhaps having that experience of seeing what does go on in other parts of of, of Europe, in in particular, you know, does give you a slight advantage when it comes to like, 
we've got a, a new scheme th- coming through now for, for Welsh agriculture, which is going to be very demanding on some farmers. It's, it's a very ambitious scheme. Uh, and I just wonder how much of it is going to be taken up. But governments tend to operate like that. It, it, it's an environmentally based scheme. It's going to put huge pressure on, on production. But it's, it's the way, you know, it's the way politicians are thinking. Climate change is, 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 is the buzzword. And I, I think, okay, that's fine. We can do our bit. But when I look out from my bedroom window, I can see one hell of a lot of trees. And uh, I'm, I'm also aware that that grass is sequestrating carbon all the time. Sure. It's, uh, it's a difficult one. Though. It is a difficult one, isn't it? And it's not one we can get into in too much detail. And it's an argument that will never end. And maybe it will one day. Who knows? And, and let's just move on. That you've 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 done your stint on the television as well. I think you're quite well well known to people in the the. Welsh TV community and, and you did your stint as a TV presenter on the the big country show on HTV. Oh, and... right. Yeah, the, those those were the days. It was a, it was an interesting challenge, in fact. And um, I suppose I was I was Adam Henson's uh, sort of lookalike in in all of <laughs> he's Actually, he's more my lookalike than I'm his lookalike. He's an awful lot younger. You'd than say him. you're better looking like... than him, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did that sort of job, and I think. The way I approached it was that I remember them wanting to write a script for me. And I thought, well, really, if you can't manage without a script, you really shouldn't be doing the job. And I think listening to how other people, what other people's ideas were at that time, and being able to perhaps, you know, raise the next question from what they'd actually said was the attitude that I took. It's probably because I'm quite lazy as far as certainly learning scripts or, or reading scripts are concerned. But I've always felt that, you know, you've achieved something if, if you've made the person that you're interviewing or, or the person that, that's been f- focused on in it, that they're the star of the show rather than the presenters, which seems to be a bit of the case with, with some of our presenters these days. <laughs> you're not pointing at me there, are you, Bernard? Because I did try and do <laughs> no, that. No, no, I'm no, learning no, no, my no. way through this one. I've been 100 episodes now. You're, 100, you're episode 101, and, and uh, I'd like to think that I've learned a lot on this job there. But uh, no, I'll let you carry on. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, 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 it, I say it was an enjoyable episode in my life. We again met an awful lot of interesting people, saw a lot of interesting ideas, uh, and I think also, again, you know, the media are pretty hard on on agriculture at the moment, and in a way, they they're quite hard on on the rural community as well, uh, because we're a minority, I suppose, as much as anything, and certainly they don't. I shouldn't really be saying it, but but the BBC seemed to to take a certain amount of pleasure in in knocking what's going on in the countryside. When in when you begin to, if you started to analyse it in a functional and and in a, an appropriate sort of way, that you know we're not really the baddies that that, that some of them make us out to be. Sure. And certainly, you know, thinking that we're going to be the answer to all the climate change problems that that industrial producers have, I think you know. I do object to that, you know, quite strongly. Mm-hmm. Okay, totally agree with you on that, and most of our listeners will agree in as well. As, as I said, you've you, you've you've made a, f- a few films and supplied livestock. You mentioned earlier on for films and TV programs, and yeah, that will bring its challenges, wouldn't it? I mean, I can imagine film crews and and, and everything else in there. It's something that uh, that would would stand you in good stead, but dealing with all these, these TV and media would be uh, would be quite an interesting challenge. I think as long as you accept the the, the the idea that most of them will know nothing at all about anything, uh, as far as as far as livestock are concerned, certainly it's perhaps a good wet place to start, and then just take it from there. Really, okay. I think you know we we all if if you accept the advice of of a so called expert, you know you you have to be prepared at least to go some way towards what they want. If you say that an animal is not going to swim in a in a lake for, for, for two hours, well, okay, they accept that sort of thing quite easily. But if you say to them, well, look, if it went in this way, uh, instead of going in that way, it's a more natural thing to do. Uh, they soon learn when it doesn't happen the first time and then it happens when you, you know, they, they have to have a certain amount of confidence in you in the same way that you have to have a certain amount of confidence confidence in them but it was uh, it was it was fascinating met some you know interesting people and and, and uh, did some things that i really wouldn't think about or most people wouldn't think about doing anything but <laughs> it was quite well 
it was quite well paid, so I, I coped. <laughs> well paid, <laughs> and and I'm going to call you the general. You you you've been known as a general. You're probably known locally as a general, or in certain media media uh, um, areas. Or anyway, in uh, the video called the Bar Studs, and uh, we've we've all seen that. It was filmed at the at the castle, and I think 21 million views there. Tell us a little bit about the the Bar Studs. Well, the biggest thing is that I should really have concentrated on how many people are going to view it and been paid on that. I would have made <laughs> far more sense. And it was just an idea that, that a company came here with about putting LED lights on sheep and getting them to do various obscure things. And um, I think, again, it really was about what the limitations were. And all we really did was was, was got sheep either to stand in straight lines and or stand in circles and they say most of the listeners will know that if you feed them for a winter in a straight line you know it comes an awful lot more naturally to them than than if you if you just randomly feed them sure. and uh, we utilize that then with a, a little bit of editing shall i say to to produce quite an if a video that was watched by an awful lot of people and i can only exceptional exceptional exceptional. well i I think i think people are very easily pleased (laughs) that's my my, uh, comment on that really but but it was yeah it it brought brought notoriety i suppose to you know what sheep supposedly could do uh and it, it it entertained a lot of people and i think that was in you know probably the most important thing of all and, uh, Although I, I did, I did turn up at a meeting in the commission, and they decided to show the video there. So this idiot from Wales who keeps <laughs> nagging on about various things also does other things. You know? <laughs> I can imagine uh, there in Europe, but it must have brought some some, uh, some visitors to the to the castle as well, and, and hopefully helped you out a little bit and, uh, financially on that way. Well, yeah, I think anything that you do in publicity terms, whether it be something like that or posing for a poster with you know a pile of sheep in front of the castle you know you, you never really know what the result of that sort of thing is going to be and if it is free publicity which you know obviously these things were you know it's a lot easier in a way to, to quantify you know was your time worthwhile or not <laughs> It's always worthwhile, as you said, unless it's uh, unless it goes against you. But we, we, we've been on time, had a great chat here, Bernard. And I'll just go on to one thing. You have something you call a Welsh longhouse. And uh, not quite sure what the Welsh longhouse is, but it's something that, uh, that you're quite proud of, I think. Well, I think, yeah, I did talk about buildings that were actually older than the castle. And that it is one of them. It's, it's the original farmhouse. And certainly if you go back before about, I think... Uh, the house that I'm in now is, is about 1870, 1880. But before that, um, it was quite common, in actual fact, to live with the cattle and, and well, particularly with the cattle, rather the sheep were always out. But it's a, a long, narrow building, cattle at one end, people living at the top end. And in fact, the longest that we have, uh, it's in the, the local church record that there were 14 people living in what are basically two rooms. Uh, a, a, a little loft above, and 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 uh, a room, a, 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 then a box bed by the fireplace. Where obviously uh, the parents that that were, yeah, I should be careful what I say now, but certainly the, the parents that were most significant as far as establishing the family were concerned. They they slept there, and the rest slept where they could then. But it 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 is quite an interesting feature, and it's amazing. We we've, we've sort of made a little bit of a museum, and it, it is amazing the interest. Particularly that Americans have in it, in fact, that I suppose they're, they're sort of coming back to their roots and, and anything that is related directly to how their families past lived in, in the past is is quite important to them. Well, uh, um, Bernard, I think it's so fascinating. This, you're the first person, the few people I've had on this podcast from Wales, but the first person I think that's owned a castle. And it just, just remind us where, where our listeners can especially from overseas and where we can find uh, the Carrick Kenner Castle online and, 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 and geographically? Well, Carrick Kenner Castle is right in the middle of Carmarthenshire, um, one of the larger counties in South Wales. SA19, 6UA is our postcode, if you can get that down. But certainly it is something that is, is very well known, particularly in, in, in South Wales as far as castles are concerned. We've got a lot of castles here. But I'd like to think we're one of the ones that certainly is most romantically and and uh, 
I suppose location, location, location is 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 what it's about. Okay. And we're, we're always pleased to see people, no matter where they come from. And Bernard, I'm sure if you, if they turn up there, they will they'll get to see you there, wandering around there amongst the guys, and and the whole thing sounds uh, very very homely. Yeah, unless I'm wasting my time in some show somewhere or going to a meeting with the that probably turns out to be totally useless. <laughs> or turning out and, and and looking and making sure that Brussels keeps a, keeps themselves in order for 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 all of us and. Bernard, I really, really appreciate your time. It's been fantastic to have you on there and to say what, what, something with a difference. And, and I wish you uh, well with your Longhorns. I, I know we bumped into each other at the at the Royal Well Show, and and you've had you've won more success with the Longhorns than probably most of the people in the country. And you maybe played yourself down a little bit there, but uh, as a livestock podcast, uh, you're, you're one of the top Longhorn breeders in the country, and I uh, appreciate that. Thank you very much for the, the opportunity to do it. Okay, well, it's great to speak to you, and and and, and thank you very much as well, and uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the Royal Welsh Show next time, if not before. Absolutely, bye now. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Top Lines and Tales. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Harbro, for their continued support. And uh, Harbro are also sponsoring a few other uh, shows this winter, including Live Scott and having a stand at Agri Scott, where hopefully I'll be there w- along with them, maybe doing some live podcast from that event. So thanks very much to Harbro. Uh, please uh, look them up on the internet or on their, on their website or on social media. And uh, whilst on the subject of social media, why not? Uh, look up the Top Lines and Tales Facebook page where you'll find other information to back up this podcast and some great photographs. Thank you.